In the next 20 or a little over minutes, I have taken the task to try and explain to you a concept that I think is extremely important for me to remember, I think for every Muslim to remember. It's going to come from a Madani Surah of the Qur'an and as I try to get to the point, I hope that you can keep in mind the pieces that I'm trying to put together in the course of this very brief khutbah. Where I'm going to begin is somewhere familiar for all of you. The Qur'an was revealed in stages and the two major stages of the revelation was the Meccan and the Medinan revelation. So the Prophet wasallam was given two-thirds about of the Qur'an when he was in Mecca and the last third when he was in Medina The content of the Qur'an in Mecca and Medina is fundamentally different. There is some overlap, but actually, as far as the subject matter of the Qur'an, there is a significant difference between the way Allah spoke and what Allah spoke about in Mecca and the way Allah spoke and what Allah spoke about in Medina. And of the many things he talked about in Mecca, you will note one thing, that Allah kept bringing up nations of the past that God destroyed. So any of you that read the Qur'an regularly, and you go through the Meccan surahs of the Qur'an, the nations of Ad and Thamud, and the nation of Nuh alayhi salam, and the nation of Lut alayhi salam, and the nations you know, of Shu'aib alayhi salam, these pre- and Fir'aun of course, Nations that, that came in long time ago in history, some of them very close to the Arabs also, because when they used to travel, they saw some of the ruins and buried sites of some of those nations. Some of them were further away. Allah even mentioned nations around the world that have been buried, that, we'll, that the Arabs will never know about. And even now, nowadays we're doing digs and archaeological excavations in islands in different parts of the world, and you'll find you know, buildings and villages and even entire pyramids and castles 200 feet under the ground that are like 20,000 years old, 15,000 years old. And Allah says about them, فَغَشَّاهَا ma غَشَّا Allah covered whatever He covered. Right? So He's not just referring to those nations. But let me get to the point. He brings up these nations over and over again because the primary audience, the main audience of the Meccan Qur'an were the non-Muslims. So yes, people were accepting Islam, but majority of the Qur'an that was revealed, revealed to the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca, two-thirds of the Qur'an was actually da'wah. Anybody who was listening, chances were the majority of them were not Muslims. Very few people had accepted Islam. You've heard of dozens and dozens and dozens of stories of companions of the Prophet ﷺ who would hear the ayat of Allah and then they would become Muslim. So the, the audience to whom Allah was speaking was non-Muslim. And actually one of, and non-Muslims are not the same. They're not all the same. They're in different levels. And one of them was the worst of them. One category of non-Muslims was the worst of them. And these were the elites of the society, the billionaires, if you will, the political leaders, if you will. Even today, I mean, I don't know where you get your information from. Many of you probably TikTok. There's plenty of content available on the corruption of the, t- uh, the financial elite and the corruption of the political elite. And that's something everybody's always known. People at the top have the highest levels of corruption, right? And they work with each other to maintain their power and maintain their wealth. Doesn't matter how much blood they suck from the common man and how much, how much they destroy the rest of society so long as they can hold on to their power and their position. The Qur'an identified the leaders of Mecca, the billionaires, if you will, of Mecca, as the, one of the main problems. In fact, the idols around the Kaaba were actually a really good business strategy for the leaders of Quraysh because it was making sure that tribes from around the region would come and pay respect to their own personal idol and that's way, that, that way they can maintain tourism in Mecca because Mecca doesn't exactly have the kind of weather that's suitable for tourism. So you have to have reason to, for people to come there and spend their money and spend time there. And every time people come in, more money comes in, right? And then they have special privileges. They have security because they are custodians of the Kaaba, you know. Uh, you know, Allah Azza wa even makes reference to that in Surah Al-Ankabut that he made a haraman aminan that Allah made this haram a, space, a safe space for them, a safe place for them, and they can travel, like Allah says, رِحْلَةَ الشِّتَاءِ وَالصَّيْفِ 
But then why did Allah talk about these past nations? He was telling the Quraysh, look, you are rejecting Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. You are rejecting the word of Allah. You are rejecting Allah. You're not the first ones to do this. There were people before you that were billionaires like you. In fact, they had more money than you. There were people before you that had power like you. In fact, they had much more power than you can even imagine in this region. Your little situation over here where you have some power in Mecca is nothing compared to what the Fir'aun used to have. Dil Autad is nothing like the kind of structures that Thamud and Ad used to build and the kind of might and power they used to have, the kind of militaries they used to have. So Allah is basically telling them, you think you're so big and tough, I've dealt with bigger and tougher before you. And here's how I deal with them. When they, when they reject my messenger, when they do kufr of my messenger and they make fun of my messenger and they even try to kill my messenger, then eventually what I do with them is I destroy them in this world. I don't just give them the warning of hellfire or judgment day. That's for everybody. Every human being will come in before Allah on judgment day. But those nations have to pay a price in this world. They get annihilated in this world before they pay a price in the next world. And that is part of the, you can call this the collective punishment. So individually in the Quran, in the, every individual, you and me and everybody else is going to come in front of Allah individually. كُلُّهُمْ أَتِيهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَرْدًا Allah says every one of them will come in front of Allah alone. So I have to go alone, you have to go alone, every one of us has to go alone. But there's another system of Allah, another system of justice of Allah, and that system of justice is for nations. And those nations that get a messenger, and then they reject that messenger, and they mock Allah and the ayat of Allah, and they receive a miracle, and they reject that miracle, Allah doesn't just deal with them on judgment day, He deals with them in this life too. And he, this is one of the most repeated lessons in the Meccan Qur'an. The Meccan Qur'an. So the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum ajma'een, who were reciting the Qur'an day and night, they heard these stories of these nations over and over and over again. If you do even a cursory search of a nation like Thamud, it's mentioned over 25 times in the Qur'an, across the entire Meccan Qur'an. And it's not just a mention, it's their story over and over again, referenced over and over again. Now, here's the point that I'm trying to make. The Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet were very familiar with the subject matter of the Meccan Qur'an. And I told you the, 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 the kind of things Allah talked about in Mecca are somewhat different than the kinds of things Allah talks about in Medina. Now when we come to Medina, one of the things that changes is Allah addresses the primary audience is no longer the non-Muslims. The primary audience is the Muslims. Allah is talking to you and me. So we get this new introduction to a phrase, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu. You've heard this phrase a million times. That is a Madani phrase. That's not used in the Meccan Quran. That's used in the Madani Qur'an, after the migration, the Muslims are a community and now Allah is giving guidance to this community. Okay. And in this, the, the subject matter is not the same as, oh, those nations got destroyed and all of that. That's not the subject anymore. The subject is how to deal with the enemy that's coming. For example, there's a lot of movement from the Quraysh. There's also the, the hypocrites that are within Medina that are trying to sabotage the government of the Prophet ﷺ. So how to deal with the hypocrites, how to deal with the, the neighboring tribes, the Jews and the Christians, and how to do da'wah with them, and what to say to them, and how to speak with them. These are the kinds of instructions that are coming in Medina. And of course, then there are the, the, the aspects of worship and rituals that are coming in Medina. So how are you supposed to fast? What are the rules for fasting comes in Medina? The rules for Hajj come in Medina. Some of the laws like the law about riba or the law about inheritance, right? These laws in their, in their details come in Medina. And how to, how to lend money, how to borrow money. Those kinds of instructions come in Medina. And one such law, you might be surprised, the one law Allah talks about more than any other law, the one law, one rule that Allah gets more space in the Quran than any other rule is divorce. Allah talks about more than anything else. There's, compared to that, inheritance is less. Compared to that, you know, like uh, salah gets less details. In fact, doesn't even get much details. Compared to that, fasting gets mentioned what? Once. And that's it. There's one, one couple of ayat about fasting and we're done. The discussion will not happen again in the Quran. But when it comes to the subject matter of divorce, and not just divorce, how should a man divorce a woman? How should he do it? 
Allah talked about it in so much shocking detail over and over again. In Surah Al-Baqarah, multiple pages if you're counting pages. Then again, instructions in Surah Al-Nisa. Then again, some guidelines in Surah Al-Nur. Then again, some guidelines in Surah Al-Ahzab. Then again, an entire surah, Surah Al-Talaq. Then again, other references like in Surah Al-Tahrim. Multiple times in the Quran on this one subject. Now, here's what I want. This is my subject. And the nations that got destroyed. Why am I bringing this up? Let me share with you one small piece of a small surah that was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ in Medina. And I already told you what kind of subject is in Medina. This is Surah at talaq the surah of divorce. And after seven ayat, giving Muslims instructions on how to do the divorce, then Allah says, وَكَأَيِّمْ مِنْ قَرْيَةٍ عَتَتْ عَنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّهَا وَرُسُلِهِ فَحَاسَبْنَاهَا حِسَابًا شَدِيدًا وَعَذَّبْنَاهَا عَذَابًا نُكْرَ he says, and how many nations have there been that arrogantly disobeyed the instructions of their master and arrogantly disobeyed their prophets? Then Allah gave them intense punishment and Allah, Allah held them to account and gave them intense punishment and they tasted the consequences of their deeds meaning in history they already tasted the consequences of their deeds and then there's the next taste coming which is judgment day Allah mentioned this not in the Makkan Quran now he's mentioning this in in Madani Quran Surah Talaq and the Sahabi listening to this who's been listening to the Quran from the Makkan time Ya Allah you talk like this when you talk to the Kuffar you speak like this when you talk to the Quraysh because they act like the nation of Nuh and they act like the nation of Lut and the nation of Salih and the nation of Shu'aib and they act like Fir'aun so you tell them about Fir'aun and how you destroyed Fir'aun why are you telling us about this? why, why are you telling us you destroyed previous nations or do you punish previous nations? in order to step back and understand something let's understand one thing about the word Utu Utu in Arabic is a little bit different from, from Isyan Isyan means disobedience Isyan, disobedience. Utu actually means disobedience with defiance. So there's an element of kibr in Utu. So to put it simply, there's a student who didn't do his homework. And the teacher says, where's your homework? And he says, sorry, I didn't do it. I'm so sorry, teacher. And the other one says, I didn't do it. What? Yeah, I didn't do it. What are you going to do about it? You're going to call my dad? Here's my phone. Call him. Put it on speaker. That kid is not doing asyan, he's doing rutu. So he's not just disobeying, he's like, so what? And he's defiant, he's arrogant in his disobedience. This is the next level. Allah warns about a nation that doesn't just disobey Allah, they do rutu. They get arrogant. And then Allah punishes them, not in the next life, in this life. And he's warning the Muslims of this. So I, when I was studying this a couple of months ago with my team, I started wondering, Allah collectively, He destroys nations. And He says things like, فَهَلْ تَرَى لَهُمْ مِنْ بَاقِيَةِ Is there even a single individual left? Nobody's left. Nobody left alive. But Allah has another rule. And the other rule of Allah is what happens when Muslims disobey Allah. Okay, those stories are about when non-Muslims refuse to obey Allah and the Messenger. But does Allah also have a rule for when Muslims in the, in the hundreds, in the thousands, in the millions, if Muslims start disobeying Allah, does He have a rule for that too? And the example we have for that in the Qur'an before us is the example of Banu Israel. Banu Israel were the Muslims before us. They were given a book, they were given prophets, they accepted those prophets, they believed in those prophets, they believed in that book, they identified themselves as people of revelation, and yet Allah says they disobeyed Allah. So what did Allah do with them? Let me read this to you from Surah Al-A'raf. Just so you understand, what, how does Allah deal with a Muslim nation that disobeys Allah? Okay, because He's already explained in Makkah and Quran how He deals with disobedient nations outside of Islam. This is now inside of Islam. When they arrogantly disobeyed, Utu again, this is talking about the Israelites. When they arrogantly disobeyed against the things, or about the things they were told not to do. We told them become monkeys, rejected. 
apes. Now you could think this is biological apes, but there's something else going on here. You know how apes behave? Apes are some of the most violent animals on the planet. And apes can turn violent without warning. And they become extremely violent even against each other. You could have apes that get along for many years and one day, one gets pushed by the other and he beats the other one to death. And the other ones join in and beat and cannibalize their own. They'll eat the, uh, their opponent's face. His own brother, he'll eat his face. When apes will see some food or something, they will attack. They won't care who it belongs to or if it's dangerous, they just attack. And they act like a herd. They don't think for themselves. If one is doing it, they all start doing it. So you'll become these impulsive, herd-minded people that'll just not even think for yourselves. You'll act like apes. You'll start beating on each other, fighting each other, killing each other. This is what you will become. This is one punishment. But Allah is not done. وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكَ لَيَبْعَثَنَّ عَلَيْهِمْ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ مَنْ يَسُومُهُمْ سُوءَ الْعَذَابِ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَسَرِيعُ الْعِقَابِ وَإِنَّهُ لَغَفُرُ الرَّحِيمُ And Allah said, until the day of judgment, people will keep coming that will keep having power over them. Allah will keep putting other nations, making them more powerful over the Muslims that will humiliate the Muslims with the worst kind of punishments and the worst kind of tortures over and over again. And at the end of it, Allah says, and Allah is very quick to take, to take vengeance, but Allah is also forgiving. Meaning if Allah wanted, He could destroy a nation immediately. He doesn't have to put someone to, through centuries of humiliation. He could just fi finish them right away. Like other nations. Allah, but these, these people are being given slow, painful humiliation because hopefully that will wake them up. Hopefully this will be enough for them to make tawbah and say, okay, no more disobedience to Allah. And so Allah at the end of that said, and if they do make tawbah, there's ishara wa innahu la rahim. And certainly He's forgiving, loving and caring too. He's not just punishing. Then even another punishment for the Muslim nation that disobeys Allah. He says, We broke them up into multiple mini nations in the land. They're no longer one ummah. They are multiple, smaller, smaller, smaller nations. And you might think, oh, this must mean they got broken into different countries. They got broken into different countries. Pakistan is a Muslim country. Afghanistan is a Muslim country. Bangladesh is a Muslim country. But they have their own national interests, right? The Indonesians have their own national interests. The Malaysians have their own national interests. You can have the Algerians and the Tunisians and the Moroccans and the Jordanians and the Syrians, but they're all their own nations. They have their own interests. They have their own agendas. Even if they have family ties across from each other, you can have you know, tensions between families in the Gulf that live some of them in Bahrain, some in Qatar, some in Kuwait, some in Saudi, some in Yemen. They all have family ties, but the politics are difficult and you have no fly zones and you have all kinds of stuff going on. Sometimes that happens. That's one way to look at it. Here's another way to look at it. Even within the same country, Oh, which city? You're from Islamabad? Oh. oh you're from Karachi? Oh, these Karachi people, man. What do you speak? Saleti or Bangla? Which one do you speak? Are you, are you, are you, are you like Malay? Or are you Indian Malay? Which, which Malay are you? So, which part of Tunisia are you from? Which part of Tunis are you from? Oh, the south. Oh, okay, okay. Qatta'anahum. Oh, mama. You see... You, these are my people, those are those people, those are those people, those are those people. This is what Allah did with the nation before us. Among them are good and among them not so good. Other than that too. We tested them with good and bad, so hopefully they can come back. Then this is the last of these punishments. Then a new generation took after them that wasn't very good. A useless generation came up. A powerless generation. A backwards generation took over. Warithul Kitab. The first description of that generation is they inherited the book. They weren't Muslim because they believe it. They're Muslim because mom and dad were Muslim. They just inherited it. Why do you live in this house? Oh, my dad lives in this house. That's Viratha. Why do you have this car? This was my mother's car and we, we, we got it. That's why it's, I have it. Why are you Muslim? Oh, my man, my mom, my dad. That's why, they're, that's why we're Muslim. They have no knowledge of the book themselves. They just got it passed down in inheritance. وَرِثُ الْكِتَابِ يَأْخُذُونَ عَرَضَ هَذَا الْأَدْنَى They become extremely materialistic. They have the religion, but their real religion is money and house and fame and attention and social power. Political, that's what they love. 
They love this world, have a, this lower life. They don't care about the next life. The book is there, but the book is sitting on the shelf. What's in front of them, front and center all the time, is material benefit in some way. And Allah says, He adds, وَيَقُولُونَ سَيُغْفَرُ لَنَا And on top of ignoring Allah's book and being materialistic, they have the audacity. They are so courageous in their ignorance. You know what they say? Of course we'll be forgiven. I mean, we're the ummah after all. We should be forgiven. We have, who else has, these, these kuffar are not going to be forgiven. What, is Allah going to punish us? No, no, no. We are the chosen ummah of Allah. We are the ones. We are, we are ummah al Islam. So lana. And then, if that wasn't enough, Allah says, وَإِن يَأْخُذُوا uh, he says, وَإِن يَأْتِهِمْ عَرَضُ مِثْلُهُ يَأْخُذُوهُ That's a really interesting phrase. Allah says, if they have all the money in the world, and then they had the offer to get double of that, you would think, okay, I have enough, no thank you. No, 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 they would run after that too. This is Allah's way of describing that they had so much greed that they can never be happy with what they have. They always want something more. They always want, the greed never dies in them. They had, they're, they're, they're always wanting more, always wanting more, always wanting more. So they would go after it. And Allah questions them, أَلَمْ يُؤْخَذَ عَلَيْهِمْ مِثَاقُ الْكِتَابَ لَا يَقُولُ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْحَقِّ Wasn't the promise of Allah taken from them that they will not speak anything but the haqq? That and وَدَّرَسُوا مَا فِيهِ And they're going to study what's in the book. وَدَّارُوا الْآخِرَةِ أَخَيْرٌ لِلَّذِينَ يَتَّقُونَ أَفَلَا يَعْقِلُونَ أَوْ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ actually. And the final home is better for those who have taqwa. May Allah make us of them. Don't you people think? Allah says, don't you people think? Now, I said that ayah about the nations destroyed was from, or nations punished was from Surah Al-Talaq. The last thing I want to share with you in these couple of minutes is what is the subject of Surah Al-Talaq? You may have heard the word hudud before. Hudud is the limits set by Allah. The word had actually originally refers to a fence or a border. That's the had of some. The animal doesn't cross the fence. Allah in His laws has set some fences and said to the Muslims, stay inside this fence. And whoever crosses this fence is in trouble with Allah. You either you've done wrong to yourself, whoever crosses these limits that are set by Allah, they're doing wrong to themselves. Now listen to this. I just, I just want, we can talk about all of the hudud, we're just going to talk about the one that's in this surah, in Surah Al-Talaq. I want us to think about our, forget thinking about the governments that are not obedient. And we say we need Islamic governments, we need Sharia to be established. We need the, our, you know, our, our elites are uh, secular, they're liberal, they're bringing, you know, uh, you know, modern values to Muslim countries. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Before we do istighfar about them, let's, everyone, myself included, let's look in our own family first. And listen to what Allah is saying. Allah says in the beginning of this surah, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّبِي إِذَا طَلَّقْتُمُ النِّسَاءَ فَطَلِّقُوهُنَّ لِعِدَّتِهِنَّ وَأَحْصُ الْعِدَّةِ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ رَبَّكُمْ لَا تُخْرِجُوهُنَّ مِنْ بُيُوتِهِنَّ مِنْ بُيُوتِهِنَّ وَلَا يَخْرُجْنَا إِلَّا أَنْ يَأْتِينَ بِفَاحِشَةٍ مُبَيِّنَةٍ وَتِلْكَ حُدُودُ اللَّهِ وَمَنْ يَتَعَدَّ حُدُودَ اللَّهِ فَقَدْ ظَلَمَ نَفْسَهِ The opening ayah says, here's how you divorce women. And I won't go into the details because we have one minute left, but I'll tell you one thing. He says when a Muslim man divorces his wife, he is not allowed to ex kick her out of the house, to pressure her out of the house, or even suggest maybe it's better you go to your parents' house now. He's not allowed to say any of that or do any of that for three period cycles. And then there are additional rules if she's older three months, if she's pregnant until the baby's born. Three period cycles, and Allah says, do not expel them from their own homes. Now, you could have your name on the house, you, it's your name, on, it's your property. But actually, for those three months, it's her house. Min buyutihinna. You have to treat those months like the house belongs to her. And you could say, man, I'm getting divorced because I hate this woman. I can't get along with her. I have no, I can't even share the same room with her. Some of the fuqaha, you know what they said about this ayah? They said, if you hate her that much, you leave the house. She stays. Can't kick her out of the house. And they shouldn't leave the house. Now, I come from a Muslim country, Pakistan. Our neighboring country is Bangladesh. M millions of, hundreds of millions of Muslims in India, Sri Lanka. You know what the common practice in our countries is when somebody divorces a woman? 
Muslim countries, Muslim families, the moment the guy says, you're done, I divorce you, he calls her dad, come take your daughter. She, come to, I'm done, take her away. The first thing Allah said is, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ رَبَّكُمْ لَا تُخْرِجُوهُنَّ مِنْ بُيُوتِهِنَّ Have taqwa of Allah, your Rabb, don't expel them from their homes. Don't expel them from their homes. And they shouldn't leave. And then he said, and these are the hudud of Allah. And what is the man, common, this is the most common thing. And we say, oh, we, we want the hudud of Allah. We want to uh, abide by the sharia of Allah. When Allah says his hudud, we say, come take your daughter. Get out, get out of my house. Get out of my house. How many millions of women, where am I going to go? I have small children. How am I going to pay for them? And Allah made the expense of the child a responsibility of the man in the Quran exclusively. Exclusively. The children's support, child's support, is exclusively the man's responsibility. Explicit. These are from the hudud of Allah. Okay, if one person breaks this rule, okay, maybe that's just one person who's sinful and you're in there in your family and you don't say anything. So, you know, when you don't say anything, وَفِيكُمْ سَمَّعُونَ لَهُمْ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِالظَّالِمِينَ You're listening to it happen, you're watching it happen, but you're not saying anything. Well, Allah knows all the wrongdoers. The one who does it and the one who watches is like a spectator. Can't say anything to my uncle. Can't say anything to my older brother. He's my older brother. Etc, etc. We do this all the time. And the, the point I'm trying to make to you is if enough, of us, if enough of us do this, if enough Muslims break the law of Allah, this limit set by Allah, and we're proud to do it too, we're being a real man about it too, we do utu, then Allah has a formula. Allah has a rule. When you do this enough times, I will make you fight each other and kill each other. I will break you up into multiple nations. I will have other people have more power over you and they will humiliate you in the worst, most possible ways. You will have a generation of Muslims, new generation of Muslims who won't even know why they're Muslim. They just got Islam and inheritance. They'll become extremely materialistic. All they will care about is money, looks, pleasure. That's all they'll care about. And it will never be enough for them. And they won't, they won't ever be learning and studying the book of Allah or the deen of Allah. That won't happen. This will be a punishment Allah will give to those who openly, in enough numbers, disobey Allah. So now our reading, well, why would Sahaba be warned that nations were punished before you? This is the last I am leaving you with. My time's up. He says, أَعَدَّ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ عَذَابًا شَدِيدًا فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ يَا أُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قَدْ أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْكُمْ ذِكْرًا He says Allah punished those nations Salih, Shu'ayb, those nations Aad, Thamud, those nations He says Allah gave them intense punishment Therefore, you have taqwa of Allah People of good minds that have actually become to come to believe Allah has sent a reminder especially to you Allah is reminding you through them all this time we thought Allah is reminding Quraysh through them. And now Allah is reminding you and me through them. There's a sunnah of Allah of collective punishment. I pray that Allah does not make us of those worthy of collective punishment, nor of individual punishment. I pray to Allah that even within our own families, within our own circles, when we see wrongdoing happen and an open violation of the hudud of Allah going on, that we put a stop to it. We stand by. Allah describes us as وَالْحَافِظُونَ لِحُدُودِ اللَّهِ وَالْحَافِظِينَ لِحُدُودِ اللَّهِ Those who guard the limits set by Allah. That means I have to not cross those lines. But if I, people I love are crossing those lines, I pull them back too and say, no, 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 we don't do that. We don't do that. I have to guard. That's what it means to guard the fence. So I pray that Allah makes us of those who guard the limits set by Allah, especially when it comes to our families, especially when it comes to our own, you know, uh, our own circles. May Allah Azza wa accept our tawbah and our mistakes and make us transform our behavior so we don't become people that get Allah's iqab, but we get, we get Allah's maghfirah and Allah's rahmah, His forgiveness and His loving care. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim.